Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel. So the video that I have for you guys today is one that I know is going to frustrate every single one of you to your wit's end. I would have to say that this is one of the most frustrating and blatant cases of a murder that easily could have been prevented had police just listened to a young woman who was screaming and begging for help. A case where Lauren and her friends and her family did everything right. They did everything that you're supposed to do in a case like this, but nothing was done. There were so, so many missteps in this case that led to a bright, beautiful, amazing young woman being murdered for absolutely no reason. I have been so stuck on this case. I've been looking into it for quite some time now and I have to say that this is one of the biggest misjustices that I've ever encountered in a case that I've covered on this channel. Be ready to be angry, be ready to be frustrated, and be ready to wish that something more would have been done in this case to prevent this from happening. But before we get into the case, I just wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, GlassesUSA.com. If you're anything like me and you are absolutely blind like me, then you know how expensive expensive it can be and how much of a hassle it can be to get your eyeglasses directly from your eye doctor. However, GlassesUSA.com makes that process so much easier and so much more affordable. By cutting out the middleman, GlassesUSA.com offers prescription eyeglasses up to 70% off of retail prices. You can now shop for your prescription eyeglasses online without ever leaving your home, all at affordable prices. GlassesUSA.com offers over 4,000 styles of glasses and sunglasses, including in-home brands like Audido, which is one I'm wearing right Right now, these are some of my favorites, as well as what these ones are. These ones are also Audido, and they also have Muse, which is what these sunglasses are. These have been my go-to sunnies for quite some time now. They also have designer brands like Ray-Ban, Oakley, Gucci, and so many more. You can find any style and color that you can imagine, as well as specialty glasses like kids' glasses, safety glasses, sports glasses, and so many more. Also with GlassesUSA.com, you can add any prescription to almost any pair of frames, including sunglasses glasses and blue light blocking glasses if you're someone who sits in front of a computer and looks at a screen almost all day like so many of us do. They also have this really cool try on feature where you put in a picture of yourself to see how the glasses will actually look on you before spending the money to buy them, which is really helpful when you aren't quite sure how the glasses are going to look on you. The best part of GlassesUSA.com is the price point. A complete pair of glasses starts at only $30 and free basic prescription lenses are included with every frame. It's so easy. Easy. All you do is go online, enter your prescription, place your order, and that's it. You're done. Standard shipping is free on all orders no matter how much you spend, and if for some reason you aren't happy with your order, you have 14 days to return for a refund, 100% store credit, or an exchange, hassle-free and no questions asked. The exciting news is that by clicking the link in my description box below, my subscribers can sign up for 65% off of your first pair, which is such a great deal considering they're already so affordable. And if you like the glasses that I'm wearing or any of the glasses that I've already shown, those will be linked down below as well. So again, make sure you click the link down in the description box below and head over to glassesusa.com for 65% off of your first order. Thank you again so much to glassesusa.com for sponsoring today's video and for supporting this channel. As always, I will be taking off these glasses for the remainder of the video because I know the glare is kind of bothersome to some of you guys. So now with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the murder of Lauren McCluskey. Lauren Jennifer McCluskey was born on February 12, 1997 in Berkeley, California to Matt and Jill McCluskey, and she had a little brother named Ryan. When she was a year old, she and her family moved to Pullman, Washington in August of 1998, where her parents started working as professors at Washington State University, with Jill teaching economics and Matt teaching physics. Lauren was described as being very bright from a young age. She was very active, athletic, and fearless. When she was little, she could be found climbing trees and climbing walls. Lauren absolutely loved animals and volunteered at the Whitman County Humane Society, helping to socialize cats so they would be easier to find homes. She also had two cats of her own, Fuzzy and Victory, who she adored. She also spent her time volunteering at the YMCA and for the Special Olympics. She was described by some as quiet, but her parents would say that more accurately, she chose her words carefully. 
She loved being with friends, she loved dancing, singing karaoke, and she even did stand-up comedy from time to time. She was one of those girls who, yeah, she was shy, but once you got to know her, she was a fun ball of energy to be around. Lauren was also a devout Christian. She grew up attending Community Congressional United Church of Christ, and in college, she attended Capitol Church in Salt Lake City. She was also a member of the Fellowship of Christian Athletes at the University of Utah. Lauren was known to be an incredible athlete. When she was eight years old, she entered her first Junior Olympic Association track meet and set the Junior Olympic records in high jump, long jump, and 400 meter run. When she was nine years old, she qualified for nationals and competed in high jump, hurdles, and multi-events, earning USA Track and Field All-American 19 times and setting several records, 12 of which still stand. As she competed at the national level, she made friendships with so many different athletes across the country, their families, and different coaches from all over. By the time she entered high school as a freshman, she was the Washington State High School Champion in high jump, and she placed second in 100-meter hurdles. By the time her junior year came around, she trained at Spire Institute and attended Andrews Osborne Academy in Ohio before returning to Pullman to finish off her senior year of high school. At the 2015 Washington State High School meet, she qualified in four events, scoring in three and helping her team place third overall in the state. She also set the Pullman High record for the 100 meter hurdles and placed ninth at the U.S. Junior Championships in the Hepathlon that year. Lauren went on to graduate from Pullman High School with honors and accepted a track and field scholarship at the University of Utah to compete in the Pac-12 Conference. There, she competed in multi-events and high jump. She earned Pac-12 honorable mention and MPSF All Academic Awards at her school and is 10th on the all-time performance list for her high school and the university pentathlon. Those around Lauren were amazed with her work ethic in the classroom, weight room, and on the track. She never complained, even when things got really tough, even if the weather was bad or any other time. And she truly blossomed in college. She was incredibly smart and her professors, classmates, teammates, and coaches all loved and admired her. However, even though Lauren was very accomplished and an amazing athlete, she was always very humble and didn't always give herself much credit. When the reporters from her hometown would write about her accomplishments in the local newspaper and would interview her for comments, she would always deflect focus away from her and would talk about how amazing her teammates were and how supportive her family is. Lauren was also a very gifted writer, winning awards all throughout her time in school for writing. She was a model student athlete, earning herself a 3.77 GPA and was in the process of applying to graduate school to start in 2019. She wanted to eventually graduate and find a job in public relations or academic advising, and she wanted to move somewhere warm, maybe somewhere like San Diego. Her graduation date was nearing, and so her senior year of college, she really started to flourish in her confidence and her sociability. She spent much of her life with her head down, concentrated on her goals, and going on a very straight-edge path. However, her senior year, it seemed that her upcoming graduation put her in really good spirits. She was looking forward to being done with the pressures that came with school, the deadline, the papers, the studying. She started going out to downtown Salt Lake with her friends, even going to karaoke nights and getting up on that stage and singing in front of a room full of her friends and strangers. She was building her confidence and she was excited for what the future held. Lauren and her mother, Jill, were incredibly close even when she went off to college. The two would speak every single day, sometimes multiple times per day about everything, whether it was about Lauren's workload or boys or track. Naturally, Jill was was a worried mother. She only wanted what was the best for her daughter, and being so close to one another, Jill got a really good look into what Lauren's life was like. She was 21 years old. She was beautiful, and she was driven, but she never really spent too much time dating. She had a couple of short-term boyfriends, but nothing was ever serious. She had her goals. She was so focused, and she had dreams of one day becoming an Olympian. However, during Lauren's senior year, she met a 28-year-old man who introduced himself as Sean. So, one one night, Lauren and her roommate at the time, Alex, decided to go to downtown Salt Lake to a bar called the London Bell. This is where she met Sean, who worked there as a bouncer. He was tall and muscular, and he definitely looked the role of a bouncer, and something about him caught Lauren's eye. When they got into the bar that night, Lauren could tell that Sean would often come over to their table and sort of check in on them every now and then, and she could just kind of tell that Sean was into her. So that night, she decided to write down her phone number on a nap 
napkin and she gave it to Sean as they were leaving the bar. This was definitely a move that Lauren would not have normally done, but again, it was her senior year and she was starting to be more confident. Later the next day, Sean had texted Lauren and she was really excited about a date that they had set up later that same day at the rock climbing gym. On the first date, he bought her a bouquet of roses, he took her out for dinner, and he even wanted her to meet his friends so that he could show off his beautiful date. After this date, Lauren called her mom Jill in excitement. She gushed on the phone about how handsome he was, how sweet and gentlemanly he was. So Sean told Lauren that he actually was not from Salt Lake or Utah. He grew up in New York and he was actually only working part-time as a bouncer so that he could pay for his associate's degree in computer science at Salt Lake Community College. Now Jill, Lauren's mother, was a little bit off-put at the fact that Sean was 28 years old, so he was a bit older than Lauren, who was only 21. But Lauren had always been pretty mature for her age, so Jill was not surprised that she was kind of into older and more mature men. As the two started dating, Lauren's roommate and her very close friend Alex was very excited for her, and they seemed like a really good couple at first. He would take her out for dates, he would get her flowers all the time, and he seemed like the perfect gentleman. But very quickly, Alex started to notice some things that were a bit strange about their relationship. One thing was that Sean stayed the night in Lauren's campus apartment room almost every single night. She couldn't understand how Lauren, a 5'9 athlete and a much larger, taller, more muscular man, could be comfortable sleeping in her twin-size student apartment bed. She also sort of wondered why Sean was over at Lauren's place so much. She thought, doesn't he have his own place? However, at this time, I could definitely see how this wouldn't necessarily be weird. When people start dating, I feel like it's totally natural to just wanna spend every waking moment together, even if that means kind of more uncomfortable sleeping arrangements. So that isn't the most bizarre thing ever, but it is a bit weird if they were really only going to Lauren's place and never over to his place. But then only a week into their relationship, Alex started to notice some very concerning behaviors in their relationship. Lauren would say some things to Alex that sort of stood out to her and made her feel that maybe Sean was a bit controlling. Lauren would say things like, he told me to wear a jeans and t-shirt, or he told her that it was okay if she invited her friends to the bar, which of course Alex questioned why she would need his permission to bring her friends to the bar in the first place. She also noticed that she would rush over to her phone to reply to his text message to avoid replying too late. It even got to the point that if Lauren was driving, she would ask Alex to reply to him on her phone so that she wouldn't take too long to reply even though she was driving. She would be anxious about being late to their dates and would rush to get ready to make sure she got there on time. Alex noticed that he didn't want her to go out without him because he was afraid that she would talk to other men. If he called her, Alex could hear him starting out most phone calls with, where are you, what are you doing, and who are you with? So Alex started asking Lauren about this. She was getting worried for her friend and she wanted to make sure that she was okay. She started telling Lauren that these behaviors are not normal. They're controlling. But Lauren pretty much just told Alex that Sean had been cheated on in previous relationships and he was just really worried. He had some trust issues, but their relationship was still very new. Lauren reassured Alex that once they got to know each other better, once they established their relationship and you know established their boundaries and all that, that things were going to get a lot better. So Alex did not push it too much. Alex would later say that she knew about situations where you know men would try to cut off their girlfriends from their other friends if they got an idea that their friends were starting to catch on to their bad behaviors. Alex wanted to make sure that Lauren always had someone that she could always go to and always count on and she didn't want to risk a situation where Lauren would be cut off from Alex, so Alex didn't push the issue too much farther. However, over the course of the next few weeks, Alex started to notice even more concerning things. Lauren's appearance started to change. There were pretty frequent times where Sean would ask Lauren to come pick him up late at night from his job. So of course, doing this made Lauren really tired. She was up late at night doing all these things for Sean when she had her own things to worry about during the day and Alex started to notice this. But Alex also noticed that Lauren was losing a little bit of weight, her face looked pale, and her eyes were starting to look glassy. Alex was constantly asking Lauren if something was wrong, if everything with Sean was okay, Hey, but even only a few weeks into their relationship, Lauren refused to say anything negative about Sean. 
that was just her personality. She didn't have anything negative to say about anybody. Other friends of Lauren started to notice these concerning behaviors in her relationship, so they actually went to the campus housing staff to tell them that they were worried about Lauren and that they were concerned that this man was staying at her apartment way too often. They also mentioned to the camping housing staff that Sean had mentioned a few times that he was bringing a gun on campus, and of course, this really concerned her friends. They notified the campus safety of this as well, well, but for the time being, nothing was done. By fall break of that year, on October 5th, Lauren went back home to Pullman for the week to spend some time with her family. At that point, she decided to do some online research about the guy that she was dating, and this is when she found out the very disturbing truth about the man that she had been dating. She found out that his name, Sean, actually was not his real name at all, and he had been lying about his name this entire time. His name was actually Melvin Rowland. She also found out that he was not 28 years old. He was actually 37 years old. And turns out Melvin was actually a registered sex offender. So now let's talk more about the man that Lauren was really dating. So Melvin Rowland was in fact born in New York and he was adopted when he was an infant. He was described as having a good childhood with no real problems until he was about 15 years old when his adoptive parents passed away. After this, he was placed in a group home until he was about 17 years old and then went to a private school in Colorado for the time being. When he was 20 years old, he moved to Utah and started taking classes at the Salt Lake Community College and was working as a CNA a or a certified nursing assistant. By 2004, he was charged with enticing a minor over the internet and forcible sexual abuse. He had tried a 13-year-old girl that he had met on the internet to have sex with him. Apparently, there was a situation where he did the same thing with two other underage girls, and for this, he was sentenced to 1 to 15 years in prison. He was originally granted parole in 2012, and he was out for two months, in the meantime, he violated his parole four times. This included failing to meet with his probation officer, failing to participate in his required therapy, possession of pornography, and another violation in relation to his status as a sex offender. I believe this other violation was that he didn't notify a job or something like that about his status as being a sex offender. Then after that, he was sent back to prison and he stayed there for about a year. By 2013, he was granted another parole and he managed to stay out for two and a half years before once again violating his parole four times and was sent back to prison. These four violations were similar to his previous violations, not going to therapy, not meeting with his probation officer, having pornography, and this time he was not supposed to have any access to the internet and he did not listen. In prison, he completed sexual offender therapy and he received a satisfactory grade from his therapist. So once again, he was released from prison in April of 2018 and he told the parole board that this time he was changed. He said that he knew he violated his parole before, but he had a child now and even though he did have issues with his child's mother, having a family had changed him for the better. He said that he had a terrible experience in jail and he did not want to go back. He said that he was willing to work towards bettering himself, attending therapy, and working towards a career. His conditions for parole this time was that he could not have any internet access without the parole board's permission, which clearly that worked pretty well last time. He couldn't have any social media accounts, and he had to complete a sex offender program. When he was released, he was labeled a moderate risk offender, which required monthly visits from his parole officer. From the months of April to October, Melvin had these six visits with his parole officers, and his officers found out about two parole violations. In May of 2018, his parole officer found out that he was messaging different women, you know, texting them on his phone, and one of these women had a five-year-old dog. So first, he was not allowed to speak to anybody who had children unless it was within his family or if he had permission from the parole board. He admitted to them that the way he had met these women is that he was on different dating sites, which he didn't know counted as social media, but it did. So this too broke his parole. His officer gave him a verbal warning and said that he was not allowed on any social media. Then in August of 2018, he tested positive for marijuana, which was also against his parole. Once again, he was given a verbal warning and he was told to talk about this in his next therapy visit. During this time, Melvin was staying in 
in a room at the Homan Hotel near 300 South and Rio Grande Street. This hotel caters to former inmates, sex offenders, and homeless individuals who just need somewhere to stay. This hotel would often let people stay there for free in exchange for volunteer work or helping maintaining the building. His parole officer also noted that he was studying really hard and was going to school to become a Cisco certified network assistant. Passing this exam would help him get a job in information technology. He said that if this didn't work out, he wanted to learn how to fix heating and cooling systems and get a job in that area. Also, as we know, Melvin has a small child who he was apparently trying to get custody of this time as as well. So by all accounts, it looked like, yeah, he might have had trouble with using drugs occasionally. Maybe he was trying to meet different women through dating apps, but otherwise he was doing great for himself. He was studying, going to school, trying to get a job. So again, as we know, he was released from prison shortly before he met Lauren and had all of these other things going on that Lauren had no idea about until she did this research into him. Of course, finding out all of this just left a knot in her stomach and she was ready to finally end things with him. She returned back to campus on October 9th, but she was supposed to attend a wedding with him that evening. She called Alex to tell her about everything that she had found out and that she wanted to break up with him, but she couldn't just text him and never see him again because she actually let him borrow her car for the week while she was home for break. Alex told Lauren that she definitely should not be going to that wedding, that she needed to go somewhere in public with Melvin and end things that way. So again, it seemed like Alex just wanted what was best for her friend and she was trying to tell Lauren different things to try and keep her safe, which I really admire Alex for. But as Lauren would later tell Alex, she actually found out that while she was talking on the phone with Alex and talking about how she wanted to end things with Melvin, he was actually standing outside of her apartment and he was crouched below her bedroom window, watching her and listening to her. As soon as she hung up the phone, he busted into her bedroom to confront her about what she had just said to Alex. He said, how dare she talk about the relationship with someone else? So Lauren used that as an opportunity to confront him about his criminal record. She told him about how she knew about his real age, his real name, his status as a registered sex offender, and she broke up with him right then and there. But Mel Melvin told Lauren that he actually didn't do anything that he was sent to jail for. He said that he was framed by a girl at a frat party. He said that the girl in question was actually 17 years old and not 13 years old, and he did not do anything wrong. He said that apparently she just accused him of this for the fun of it, and he said that he only pled guilty to these charges because he had to, which I don't really know what that means, but okay. Lauren did not buy any of this though. She wasn't as naive as he might've thought that she was and she tried to make him leave, but he wouldn't. According to Alex, every time she tried to get him to leave, he would force himself on her sexually. This happened several times throughout the night, according to Alex, and he did end up spending the night there. So by that next day, October 10th, Lauren told Melvin that she had track practice that day and so she had to leave. So Melvin said, okay, and he left but he actually took Lauren's car with him so that he could run some errands. But after Melvin left, she realized that she didn't have track practice like she thought she did, so she stayed home and called Alex on the phone to tell her everything that had happened that previous night. She told her about how he busted into her room, about her breaking up with him, and about how he forced himself on her multiple times throughout the night. Then later that day, Lauren started receiving mysterious text messages from numbers that she did not recognize. The first message was from a random number and it said, why'd you break up with the big guy? He really loves you. After this message, she got yet another message from another number. This text message was supposedly from a friend of Melvin's who said that he was actually going to be the one who was dropping her car back off to her, not Melvin, because Melvin could not stand to look at her after this breakup. So after telling her mother about this, Jill, Lauren's mother, decided to call the campus dispatch to request that a security officer actually go and get Lauren's car for her. She said that she was really worried because Lauren had recently broken up with Melvin and because of his criminal record and all that, she didn't want him to hurt her when she met up with him to get her car back. The assumption was, was that it wasn't actually Melvin's friends that was trying to arrange to pick up the car, that it was actually Melvin from a fake number. So they basically arranged for the car to be left at the stadium, at the university stadium, and then she had a security officer go pick up the car for her, and this car was picked up without any problem. But Lauren continued to get these mysterious text messages from numbers that she didn't recognize. She received one text saying, go kill yourself. 
And then two days later, she got another message from another number telling her that Melvin was actually dead, that he killed himself because of Lauren, and this phone number asked her if she would be attending Melvin's funeral. But she noticed that all of these texts had the same type of grammar and spelling errors that Melvin usually used, so she knew that it was him sending all of these text messages from fake numbers. He had also posted on social media, which Lauren saw, so she knew that Melvin was not dead. But then Melvin had actually texted Lauren from a number that Lauren knew, so his real number, and Lauren told him about these strange text messages that she was getting. So Melvin asked her to send him screenshots of all of these messages so that he could get to the bottom of trying to figure out who was sending these text messages to her. But either way, Lauren also got into contact with university police to report these messages. She sent them screenshots and showed them all of the evidence that she had at that time. University police and security, how can I help you? Hi, uh, this is Lauren. I called a little a uh, few days ago about um, a situation and I wanted to kind of give an update and ask about some things. Well, basically, so... Did you make a report? I, car, I did not. Okay, so you called a couple days ago about a situation you wanted to follow up on? Well, I guess it's kind of a different situation, but it's related in a way. Okay. But, um, what I you didn't make a report. Did you talk to a police officer? I well, so I had I had a security person um, drive me to pick up my car because I was I was worried about getting it. But um, so so what happened? What happened was that so I got the car and that was fine. But from one of my ex's friends but so he and then some other i've been getting these texts about from from these numbers that i um of different people saying that they were saying that he was in the hospital and then saying that like that he passed away but then but then i got a text from him and he seems to be alive so um and then they were I got a text about, you know, asking if I wanted to go to a funeral, his funeral. And I think they're trying to lure me somewhere. So you got a bunch of texts seeming like they're trying to get you to go somewhere. Um, first it was just saying... Okay, where did you receive the it was text kind of a, Where do you live? So I live at... Okay. And when did this happen? Um, so the, the, the latest one was today. When did it start? Y yesterday. At about what was time? when they were talk saying that he was the hospital. Um, it, um, I think around 7 p.m. And what time this afternoon was the last one? It was a, around, around 3 p.m. 3 p.m.? Okay. Yes. And this is all your ex's friends? Right. And are these just text messages? Yes. Okay, and are they threatening text messages? Um, well, most of them, no. But, um, I mean, they've, they've told me not to, not to go where he, at the club where he works, where he used to work. Okay, and is there a protective order between you guys, or is he just an ex of yours? Just an ex. Okay. Um, I will send this through an officer uh, to give you a call. He's going to give you a call on that last phone number that you gave me. The phone. Is that okay? Yeah, sounds good. Okay, perfect. I'll have somebody call you shortly. Okay, thanks. No problem. Bye. But even still, Lauren continued to receive concerning text messages from random numbers. By October 13th of 2018, Lauren received text messages from a number saying that if she did not pay them, that they were going to release compromising explicit photos of her. This person was demanding $1,000 to delete these pictures of her. One of the pictures that was threatening to be released was actually one that Lauren knew that she took with Melvin, so she pretty much knew that this was still Melvin who was texting her. She was panicked at this point because she had worked so hard to achieve everything in her life. She was about to graduate and she didn't want pictures like this of her like circulating around and ruining her reputation, so she did go ahead and Venmo the $1,000 to Melvin, even though the account that she sent it to was 
was not technically under Melvin's name. It's pretty much assumed that it was him at this point. She reached out to campus police once again to report this as well and provided them with screenshots, and she also inquired about the original report that she had made. University of Police and Security, how can I help you? Hi, so I'm uh, dealing with a situation um, where I'm being blackmailed for money. Um, it's so a, a photo of my me and my ex. They're um, threatening to to send it out to everyone, mm -hmm. um, and and she's asking for a thousand dollars. And this is over text. Yeah. Well. Okay, where where did you receive the messages at? Well, at first it was an email, and okay. then, um, and then over that app. Okay, where were you at when you received the messages? Oh, no, you're uh, fine. At my apartment. Okay, where's your apartment at? Okay, sorry about that. Okay, just give me one second, okay? I'm just trying to fill out my um, my paper. Thank you. Hi, are you still there? Yes. Okay, has this happened before or has it been happening or is this the first time? This is the first time. Okay. All right. There has been some harassment before. So it has happened before? Not not this particular um, type of thing. Okay, but you have had involvement with this person? Yeah. Okay. And do you know who this is? Um, so it's Sean Roland is the one messaging me. And that's who? Yeah. Is he, what's, what's your relation to him? My ex-boyfriend. Okay. Okay, and how long ago did this happen? This morning. Okay, do you know around what time? Um, the, the email was um, around 6 or 7 a.m. Okay. All right, and do you know around what time the text came? Okay. Around eight. Around eight? Yeah. All right, and can you tell me what his name is again? Yeah, it's uh, Sean Roland, S-H-A-W-N. And then his last name? R-O-W-L-A-N-D. Okay. And do you happen to know his date of birth? Uh, I'm not sure. Okay. Do you know how old he is? Uh, 37. Okay. All right. Give me one second, okay? Okay. Okay. Are you still there? Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Wait. Okay. I'm going to get your information, okay? Can you tell me your first and last name? Yeah. McCluskey. What is it? Lauren McCluskey. All right. Can I have you spell it for me? L-A-U-R-E-N. And then your last name. M-C-C-L-U-S-K-E-Y. Okay. And can I get a phone number for you? Yeah. Okay. All right. So it looks like I have everything. What's going to happen is I'm going to let one of our officers know, and he's going to call you. It may come from a blocked number. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. All right. That should be happening shortly, okay? Okay. All right. Thanks for calling. Thanks. Bye. 
So I believe this original report that she made, she did go down to the station and speak with an officer who took down her information. According to Alex, who went with her, the officer didn't even take her into an interview room to question her further about this, you know, situation that was going on. Alex said that once Lauren told the officer Melvin's name, the officer looked him up and basically said that he seems like a nice guy who didn't have a criminal record besides a parking ticket. They would later find out that this officer actually found a student at the university with the same name who didn't have a record, so it wasn't even the right person. But apparently after this, after the officer was like, no, he doesn't actually have a criminal record, Lauren was like, no, he does have a criminal record, and she showed the officer how much of a record he actually had. But still, the officer didn't really seem to think that Melvin was much of an immediate danger to her. He even suggested that maybe somebody else hacked Melvin's phones and they were the one that were making these threats. But then apparently he did take down this report and then contacted the on-call detective who coordinated the steps to have a police supervisor, you know, gain further information and question Lauren. But days passed before detectives would look into the evidence that she provided and get back into contact with Lauren. During this time, Lauren was getting very anxious and upset at the fact that they were taking so long to get back to her. She went ahead and contacted the Salt Lake City Police to see if they could help her, but they told her that this extortion case was actually covered under the university's police jurisdiction, so they routed her back to them and told her that there was nothing that they could do to help her. By October 19th, so several days had passed at this point, Lauren called the Salt Lake City Police again, saying that she had been working with the university police, but nothing was being done and she was continuing to get these harassing phone calls and text messages. She told police that she was concerned that the person who was harassing her seemed to know about the police involvement and what the police were doing with her case. But once again, Salt Lake City Police told her that she would have to go back to the campus police and figure this out with them. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm just, uh, I'm worried because I... I've, I've been working with the campus police um, at the U, uh -huh. and uh, last Saturday I reported, and then um, and I haven't gotten an update. Okay. But but someone contacted me today, someone who was harassed, and said that that they know everything about the police. And, okay. So you already spoke to the campus police. Did some did this happen on the University of Utah campus? Um, yes. Yes, and they haven't updated or done anything. So the the case it involved extortion, and those people uh, are still here me. Okay. So have you have you notified the campus police about this? Yes, I have. Okay. And what prompted you to call Salt Lake City, please? Well, I thought it was weird that um, that, it, that there are people who know about the entire case and the harassers seem to know about it more than me. And I'm concerned there might be an insider um, who's letting them know about the, ca the case. Okay. So with some... Because I haven't gotten updates. Yeah. And it's been a week. Okay. With something like that, you would want to contact the campus police back and ask to speak to your detective. If you're concerned, you could ask okay. to a detective supervisor. Since it's another agency's area, the Salt Lake Police wouldn't be involved. Oh, okay. All right. And then make sure you tell them what you told me, that this is, this is getting through to you from the suspects in your case. Okay. So, so the, the detective you said is who I should contact? Right. Call the dispatch back and then ask to speak to your detective. Okay. Uh, sounds good. Thank you. All right. And then if anything happens or if you see them when you're like out and about in Salt Lake City proper, not audit on University of Utah property, and for something mm -hmm. like that, we'd be the best people to call. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Okay. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Bye.
So finally, that same day on October 19th, an officer from the university finally called her back to ask her more about the situation, and this is when they finally actually opened a case. Apparently, the reason that this took so long was because the detective that was assigned to her case was on vacation at this time, so no one else was tasked with investigating this case, so nobody was looking at it this entire time. Either way, in this call with the detective, Lauren told him about how she had been dating Melvin, she gave details into their relationship, and she said about how they broke up, and she said that she she believes that the person who is extorting her was Melvin because like I said earlier, the pictures that were being threatened to release were pictures that she took with Melvin and only he had access to. During this phone call, she also told the officer that she had received a call from an unfamiliar number who was continuing to make these threats. She said that she knew the caller was Melvin because she recognized his voice. The officer asked if there was any threats of violence during this call and she said there was not. So during this call, the officer basically explained to her that they were going to have to get subpoenas and other evidence in order to proceed with this case and that this is a process that can take quite some time. The officer said that because these extortion threats were coming from different phone numbers using different names and multiple bank accounts, they were not able to confirm that Melvin was the one responsible for the extortion. So. This is where they left the case and they told her that if she got any more harassing calls or texts to get back into contact with them. Then by October 22nd, surprise, surprise, Lauren received even more alarming text messages. She got a text from somebody who is claiming to be the deputy chief of campus police and was asking her to go to the police station. The text read, I plan on calling you, but I'm in a meeting at the moment. Can you go to the station as soon as possible? There's something I need for you to see. I will go over the details when you get here. But Lauren was still very suspicious of this. She knew that it was possible that the person was actually not an officer and that maybe this could be an attempt at trying to lure her out of her apartment. Once again, she contacted the campus police to report this and they told her that none of them there texted her and they told her not to respond to this text message. Of course, Laura knew that this was Melvin, so she called Alex to tell her what happened and confirmed to her that she did report this to the police. We would later find out that even though she was reporting a real crime impersonating a police officer, no one did anything except for telling her to ignore this text message. That same day, on October 22nd, Melvin had snuck into Lauren's apartment building at around 3 p.m. and just sat there and waited for her in her apartment lobby. She was out in classes until about 8.20 p.m. when she arrived back in the parking lot at her campus apartment where she was met with Melvin. At this time, she was on the phone talking to her mother it just so happened that at this time, Jill had put Lauren on speakerphone so that she could hear her dad and that he could talk to her. They were all just having a normal conversation when all of a sudden, out of the blue, Lauren's parents heard her scream no, and then the line went dead. To them, it sounded like she had just been grabbed. Right away, after they heard this, of course, they were really concerned and panicked, so Lauren's dad, Matt, contacted the campus police. Security, how can I help you? Hi, is this the University of Utah? This is. How can I help you? Okay. This is a dispatch center in the state of Washington. I have a 911 call to transfer you. Hold on one moment, please. Okay. Sir, are you still there? Hi. Okay, you're on the phone with the dispatch for the University of Utah. Hi, this is, my Hi, this is Chris with the Lauren University McCluskey. of Utah Police. Hi, my daughter, Lauren McCluskey, uh, was talking to her mom, and then she just started saying, no, 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 and it sounded like someone might have been grabbing her or something. Okay. How long ago was this? This was just two, uh, two minutes ago. Okay. Oh, can you come down here? Does she live on campus? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Listen, listen. Okay, and what, what's her name? Lauren McCluskey. And you said the phone line went dead? Yeah, the phone line went dead. Okay, have you tried calling her back? No, I'm, I'm sorry, the phone is not dead, but but we can't, um, her, she must have dropped it and the phone connection is still here. It's, do you want the number or? Uh, yes, please, open. She sure. had broken up with a boy. Okay. Uh, a man, um, recently, Sean Fields is his name. Has he made any threats or anything like that? Um, her, his friends were kind of harassing her a little bit. Well, they were. 
<laughs> I can't think police were involved with that. Yes. Okay, I actually, I have an officer right here that dealt with that. Let me talk to him for one second. I'll be right back on with you, okay? I'll still be able to hear you, but okay. you won't be able to hear me. Okay. All right, Matt, are you still there? Yes. Okay. Perfect. All right, and you said she was walking to her car from what building? From the GC, which is, uh, what is that, something Commons. Gardner Commons? Oh, someone's been talking on her phone. Hello? Hi. I have a backpack and I need a okay. phone. Okay. Um, could you just uh, stay there? Uh, I think she was mugged. Um, is she okay? I was about to call the cops. Um, no, I'm talking to the cops. Okay. Now, but maybe somebody yeah. picked her backpack. Someone picked up her phone and backpack. I'm trying to get a good location. All right, where exactly? Where is that backpack out? Can you get a location for me? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Um. Um. I'm on the edge of campus by the door. Hi, Matt. Are you there? Oh, yeah. I think he's. They're pretty. Um. It's right by her apartment. It's right by her apartment? Up yeah. And you said it's right by that building? Well, I think so. Um, maybe this gal should call the cops. Tell her to, tell her to just call the cops directly. Does that, would that be better? Yeah, yeah. If she could call us directly, that would be awesome. I'm going to let you go. And if you hear anything, if you hear anything else, give us a call back, please. Okay. Police were immediately dispatched to the area who saw that Lauren's backpack and her phone were on the ground. It was thought that she had these items and then she was grabbed and that is when she dropped her stuff. Initially, police did not find Lauren in that parking lot. However, ultimately, police discovered Lauren's body in the back of the car that was parked in the parking lot. She had already been deceased at that point after suffering multiple gunshot wounds. But Melvin was nowhere to be found. At that point, police were confident that Melvin was responsible for the shooting with a gun that he borrowed from a friend. So they knew this because of how many reports she had made that they had ignored. They concluded that Melvin had driven this car onto campus, confronted Lauren in the parking lot, and then grabbed her and then put her in the back of this car and then shot her multiple times. It was discovered that after the shooting, Melvin had gotten into contact with a woman that he had met on a dating site to come and pick him up. So I'm not exactly sure or where she picked him up from, clearly not from where he just shot somebody, but he was picked up from the campus. Either way, this woman picked him up, the two went to dinner, and then he went over to this woman's house and then took a shower. After this, this woman dropped Melvin back off at a coffee shop. That same night, police put a picture out of Melvin on the news to see if anybody in the public could help in identifying him. And I believe it was the same woman who had just dropped him off who called police and told them that she did recognize Melvin. So no, this was not a woman who was an accomplice. It wasn't someone who knew about the shooting. She had just picked up Melvin because she had been dating him. She had known him. The two just went on a date according to what she thought. She didn't know any of this was going on. So as soon as she saw saw that his picture was on the news, she reported him to police. This woman called police shortly after midnight, now on October 23rd. Police then spotted him walking along the road because he didn't have a car, so he couldn't have gotten very far after this woman dropped him off. And so they followed Melvin before he entered into a Trinity AME church. As police followed him in though, Melvin saw them and took his own life by shooting himself. So, that's how this all ends. After doing absolutely nothing about this young woman who called police over 20 times, worried about one specific man who was on parole with a significant criminal history, he killed her before taking his own life and before having to accept responsibility for what he did. He took the coward's way out. I know a lot of people are upset when I say things like that. I'm not saying that suicide in general is taking the coward's way out, but I think that if you commit a heinous crime like this and then you take your own life before you're able to accept responsibility, that is the coward's way out. This is one of the most heartbreaking cases that I've ever had to look into. So it seems to me that all of these text messages were attempts to try to get her to come out of her apartment so that he could kill her, 
but she wasn't falling for it. He wasn't as naive and stupid as he probably thought that she was. So he just decided that he was just gonna wait for her at her apartment until he got the opportunity. It actually later came out that after checking the campus security videos, Melvin had visited this campus parking lot over three times over the course of three days, and it showed him walking around searching for Lauren before the shooting actually occurred. After all of this happened, more reports came out about even more missteps that were taken throughout this entire situation. So, like I mentioned earlier, Lauren's friends went to the campus housing officials to report that this man had been coming onto campus, that they were concerned that he was being abusive, and that he talked about bringing a gun onto campus. They expressed to the housing staff that they were scared for Lauren and saying that they are afraid that this man is going to hurt her. Housing staff agreed to file a report with campus safety, but they never did, apparently because their system was down. So no one thought to do it after the system was back up because apparently this case of a young woman being harassed and was, you know, in danger of being harmed, that, you know, wasn't in their minds enough to remember to make this report later. Campus housing did briefly look into the case, but they were more so concerned with whether Melvin was breaking the rules rather than trying to figure out if Lauren was safe. The housing staff came to the conclusion that they weren't going to do anything because they didn't want to overstep. They said that this was an apparently consensual relationship and that no further action was necessary. This was because, of course, Lauren was inviting him onto campus, but this was even though Lauren's friends literally said that they are afraid that she is being controlled and that they're afraid for her safety and that they believe that this man is bringing a gun onto campus. Then over the course of 10 days, Lauren called campus police multiple times with reports of threats, harassment, told them about the breakup, and told them all of these behaviors after they broke up. This is absolutely ridiculous because if the housing staff had literally just made this report, reported it to campus safety, reported it to police that, you know, these friends are coming, you know, just to be aware, not actually making a report, but just making police aware of it. And then when Lauren was calling with these threats and harassment, maybe they would have made the connection that they should do something about this. It's also ridiculous because if they would have just taken the time to look this man up, then they would have discovered that he is a felon and even owning a firearm is against the law and could be counted as a parole violation and it could have sent him back to jail. But it came out that the detectives, I believe it was the campus housing or it was the um, campus police, I'm not sure which one, but no one ever ran a background check on him and apparently they didn't even know how to do so. So by November 2nd, 2018, the university president, Ruth Watkins, said that she had asked an independent investigator to look at the actions taken by law enforcement and other individuals in this case leading up to Lauren's murder. By December 9th, the result of this review found that there were multiple times that these individuals missed out on opportunities to help Lauren. They included the fact that Lauren had reported Melvin to housing officials and this information was never passed on, as we already know. Then they pointed out the fact that while this detective that was on Lauren's case was on vacation, this should have been assigned to another officer, but it was not. She went on to say that their department is understaffed, and she said that they need to hire a victim's advocate, and that they need to train these police officers in dating violence. However, she did say that she did not believe that any action by university police could have prevented Lauren's murder. However, a second review later said that if university police had been in contact with Melvin's parole officer, maybe this could have been prevented, and I agree. Melvin had his parole officer thinking that he was trying to better himself, that he was done with prison, that he was working towards a new job and a new life, Yet yeah, he broke his parole by having a dating app, talking to a woman with a child, he didn't attend therapy, and he didn't meet up with his parole officer when he was supposed to, but apparently these violations are minor. But if his officer had found out that a young woman was making all of these reports of stalking, harassments, and threats made against her at the hands of Melvin, maybe this parole officer could have done something. The police department also came out and said that one of the reasons that his status as a felon was missed so many times was because his driver's license was never entered into the system that they used to see if someone's a felon. So when the campus looked up his driver's license, apparently it just did not come up that he was on parole, which I do understand. I understand how that could have been missed, but somehow, Lauren was able to figure out who this man was just by using Google. She didn't have access to this system. She didn't put in his driver's license number. 
she just looked him up by Google. So I cannot wrap my head around how no one in this case bothered to take the five minutes to look deeper into who this man was, because if someone would have just taken the time to do that, then maybe someone would have figured out who this man really was, who Lauren was really dealing with, knowing that this person was much more dangerous than most people thought, and then maybe someone would have done something to prevent her murder. Yet another thing that was disturbing about this case that I want to mention is that one of the detectives that was originally on Lauren's case, Miguel Diras, was fired from his new position with the Logan Police Department. He had actually downloaded explicit photos of Lauren that she had shared with police as evidence. He downloaded them to his personal cell phone and showed them to at least one male coworker, bragging to him that he got to view these images whenever he wanted to. This just makes you feel great, doesn't it? Knowing that if you're being harassed, and threatened, and you share the evidence with the police officers that some disgusting pervert in a badge can download these images and view them for his own personal pleasure. It's disgusting. After this came out, it was obvious how many mistakes were made, and the family did not agree with the university's conclusion that police could not have done anything to prevent her murder. The family ended up suing the university because of just how badly this case was mishandled, and they pointed out the very severe missteps that were taken. The school initially came back to this lawsuit and said that because Melvin was not a University of Utah student, and that Lauren had willingly invited him onto campus, that they had no duty to protect Lauren against his advances and his harassment. But of course, her family argued that they did have the duty to protect their student regardless of who their attacker was, which let me just pause for a minute to let you digest that. The university originally claimed that because the attacker wasn't their student, that even though the person being attacked was their student, and even though she called the Salt Lake City Police multiple times and was told that this is the university's problem, they said that they did not have the duty to protect her. So if the university didn't have the duty to protect her and the Salt Lake City Police didn't have the duty to protect her, who did? If students cannot feel comfortable going on college campuses, being protected from disgusting perverts who enter their campus, who is going to protect them. That was just such a disgusting statement that really did not sit right with me, as you guys can tell. It really bothered me reading that, but other students came out and said that they also had reported instances of harassment to the police who did absolutely nothing. This happened over the course of several years, so apparently this seems to be a theme at the University of Utah. But by October of 2020, the school settled the case, and they were ordered to pay $10.5 million to the McCluskey family. After they settled, the University of Utah's president, Ruth Watkins, came out with a statement saying that they deeply regret and they acknowledge that they did not handle Lauren's case as they should have, they said that they failed Lauren and her family. So this was in stark contrast with their original statement, which basically said that there wasn't much that they could have done to prevent her murder. And I am glad that they did ultimately have to take responsibility for the mistakes that happened in this case. Lauren's family came out publicly and said that they absolutely do not want to benefit financially from this situation. They said that every single penny that they receive will go towards the Lauren McCluskey Foundation. The family set up the Lauren McCluskey Foundation with the mission of supporting charitable work in multiple areas. According to the foundation's website, they want to help fund research and education programs as well as resources to improve safety on college campuses. Additionally, they wish to provide financial assistance for student and youth track and field athletes. They also want to put money towards animal welfare, helping support animal shelters and programs, all in Lauren's honor. So far, the Lauren McCluskey Foundation has done so many things. They've sponsored 10 local young athletes to help them participate in the Learn by Doing Clinic in Spokane, Washington. This clinic provides informative, hands-on track experiences aimed at allowing coaches and high school athletes to learn from some of the country's top athletes and coaches. They also added a 400 square foot addition to the Whitman County Humane Society in Pullman, which allowed them to install eight modern kennels, which allowed them to double the numbers of kittens and cats that can be housed there. They named this addition the Lauren McCluskey's Cat Wing. They also helped pass the Campus Safety Act, which aims to implement provisions to help improve campus safety and provide additional training at institutes of higher education. This was signed into law in March of 2019. They also established the Lauren McCluskey Memorial Athletic Scholarship at the University of Idaho because Lauren had practiced at their facilities for many years growing up and even 
spent her winter breaks there during college. They have done so many more amazing things, and if you want to find out more about their accomplishments and the work that they're doing and their missions, or if you want to donate, make sure you visit the Lauren McCluskey Foundation's website, which of course will be linked down below. The McCluskey family has also come out to acknowledge the positive changing that they're happy to be seeing around the University of Utah campus. One of these changes is Lauren's Promise. This is basically a promise that professors can make by putting a statement on their college syllabuses to let students know that somebody is listening, that somebody is going to believe them and then help steer them in the right direction and provide them with the resources that they need. Matt McCluskey is proud that Lauren's Promise has not just become statewide, but nationwide. Professors from over 30 universities across the country have accepted Lauren's Promise to let their students know on their syllabus that somebody is listening. The Lauren McCluskey Foundation also has stickers that you can get through their website that say, I made Lauren's promise. I will listen and believe you if someone's threatening you. You can go to their website and it says that they will mail you a sticker for free while supplies last. So if any of you are teachers or you're in a position to help others and want to make them know that you are listening, I encourage you to join the many people across the country who are taking on Lauren's promise and taking the very easy step to help others and let them know that you are listening. I always say how amazing it is to see the families of these victims making such a difference for other people in these situations. It's so amazing when families use these unspeakable tragedies that they have had to go through and make something so positive out of it. Lauren's family has done so much not only to help other victims, but to help animals and other young students who want to run track and field just like Lauren did. I am so, so very impressed by them, and I am so amazed with the work that they have been able to accomplish. But either way, that is where I'm going to end today's case. I know this was a tough one. I know that this was a lot to take in and to listen to, but I hope that this case can give some insight into how these cases are handled. I hope this teaches people that these cases need to be taken seriously. You do not need to wait until it's too late to help someone that is being stalked and harassed. Lauren was such a beautiful, bright young woman who did everything in her power to prevent this from happening. She had support of friends. She had support of family. She got the police involved. She got the campus involved. She did everything that she could to prevent this, yet somehow, this is how it ended for her. I'm upset that Melvin decided to take his own life rather than being a man and facing the consequences for his actions. I'm glad that he's not alive anymore to harm any more women or anybody else, but now he doesn't have to take responsibility for anything that he's done, and that is very, very upsetting. Of course, my heart goes out to Lauren and her family and her friends and her classmates and everybody else who loved and cared about her. But either way, that is where I'm going to end today's video. You guys know that I can rant on and on and on about the injustices in this case, but you already know. You already see them. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you go ahead and head over to glassesusa.com for 65% off of your first pair of glasses. Make sure you go ahead and follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure you send those suggestions over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.